Welcome to the Remove the Guesswork podcast. I'm your host, Leanne Spencer, and my guest this week is someone I've been really looking forward to speaking to. She's an adventurer, a women's sport advocate, or an advocate for women in general, a blogger, a podcaster. She's a friend of Body Shot and of mine. You know, I've, I've had her as a guest on our show before in May 2018. Um, we've been, my, my partner Antonio and I have been a guest on the Tough Girl podcast twice before. So we know each other pretty well. Um, a bit more about Sarah. So the Tough Girl podcast is perhaps what you're, you know, you're best known for. Um, that is a hugely successful podcast, over 850,000 downloads. It's one of the top 15% of global podcasts broadcast and listened to in 174 different countries. Um, but Sarah is also an adventurer, as I mentioned, completed the Marathon de Saab, which is six marathons in six days in the Sahara Desert, an extraordinary uh, accomplishment, and that was 2016. She's also hiked the Appalachian Trail solo and unsupported in 2017. That, I believe, is about 2,190 miles in 100 days. So that brings endurance to a whole new level. Uh, in 2018, she cycled um, 4,000 kilometers from Vancouver to Mexico, which makes some of my achievements pale into insignificance as well. I've got the Scotland coast to coast coming up, which is nothing at all. Um, but she also has a master's in women's and gender studies. She's a yoga instructor. She's a personal trainer. The Guardian newspaper voted her one of the top 10 most inspiring uh, female adventurers. Red Bull nominated her as an adventurer to follow on Instagram. Her blog and podcast have won awards. I could go on, but let's cut to it. Sarah, welcome to the show. Oh my goodness. Thank you for having me. But I'm just like blushing with embarrassment. It's so <laughs> weird when people start reading out what you've done and you're like, oh yeah, I did do that. Oh, I have done that. Well, <laughs> I did that curate discussion. it a bit as well. I did curate it a bit. I could have gone on as I say, but anyway, let's, uh, let's, as I said, let's cut to it. Um, because what, what you do really well on your podcast uh, and in a lot of your work actually is shine the spotlight somewhere else onto somebody else and their accomplishments. So there's been, you know, your podcast is full of people uh, who've done some most extraordinary things. But as I kind of touched on in the introduction, so have you. And I really want to spend this episode, the next 25, 30 minutes, talking about you, what you've achieved, what drives you. And, and your background wasn't always this stuff, was it? You've come from a, a, a different background, same way that I have. Just talk to us a bit about that. Start wherever you'd like to start. Yeah, well, I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll start followed the normal career path as such. So did my GCSEs, did my A-levels, took a gap year, went to university, graduated with a 2-1 in, in business and uh, all my friends moving down to London. And I thought, well, well that's, that's what you do after you graduate with a 2-1 two, two from, from university. So that's what I did. I headed down to London. I got myself a graduate job. I was working in finance and I started working in, you know, uh, private wealth management. I was doing it for eight years for a big global bank and um, it was soul destroying. I, but at the time I didn't realize because I thought I was enjoying it because I did not. I love the status. I love the money. I sort of love the people that I was engaging with. And it was only as I got sort of further on in my career, I started to realize that, hold on, I get those Sunday night blues really badly. I'm celebrating getting through the week. And actually, I don't really like the people that I'm working with. Mm. And my soul is dying inside. I am, I'm gray physically, mentally, emotionally. I'm just not myself anymore. I'm just, I, this, is, this wasn't how I wanted to live my life. So can I just jump in there? Yep. Um, Go. How long was it before you started to feel that way? Because that's very similar to my story. You know, just first half of my career, I absolutely loved it. Second half came more and more disenfranchised and disillusioned. And I know that a lot of people listening will probably identify with that feeling of the Sunday night blues. What was the turning point where it all went from being flash and exciting to drab and depressing and so on? Do you know, I think I don't think there was one thing that happened. I think it just it was just like these little moments, these little interactions, these little things that just sort of happened and and different things over and over again and it just gradually built and built and built but because I'm a very positive person and I will always look at the bright side and I will always give 110% to whatever it is that I'm doing and so I think I was just deluding myself and I think I was I was forcing myself to be happy but also I think when people look at you they well why why shouldn't you be happy you you live in London you've got a great lifestyle you've got great friends you've got this amazing job you've got this status and salary and you don't have to worry about anything like why aren't you happy like I should have been happy um I mean I think what, what I mean one moment I do remember was like back in 2012 when the London Olympics was on 
and I was working over, over in Canary Wharf, one of the things that we were doing was like split shifts to try and reduce the amount of transport. You know, they were trying to get more people who were working in the cities and stuff not to go into work. Mm-hmm. And so we were doing these split shifts. So you go in from 6, 6 a.m. until 1 p.m. and then 1 p.m. till 6 o'clock or whatever. And throughout the whole London Olympics, I was basically in there from six, not leaving till, till, till way past whenever. And it was just horrendous. And I got no, you know, no thank yous. No, it was just, that's just expected. And I think that was almost the tipping point. I remember sort of actually bursting into tears when I went to watch the opening ceremony, um, not the, with, with my friends on the TV sort of thing. And I just, she opened the door and you know when it's just been too much, she opened the door and I just burst into tears on her doorstep. And she was like, oh my God, are you okay? Come on in. <laughs> what can I do? And I was just, I think I, I was just done. I was just, mm. everything, I was, I was done with everything. And I just thought, I've, this is destroying me. I've got to change. Like, I've got to do something different. And to be honest, it took me until March 2013 until I actually eventually you know, built up the courage and actually left work. And to be honest, everyone thinks, oh, that's such a brave thing to do. But I actually felt like a massive failure. I was like, I, you know, I haven't succeeded at this. I haven't been able to hack it. I'm having this mini life crisis or burnout or whatever you want to call it. And to be honest, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what my purpose was in the world. And I just felt incredibly lost Mm. Um, and, and, and yes, again, from the outside, oh, it's amazing. You can go off and do all this traveling, which I did do. I visited my brother in Australia who lives over there. I went oh, went and did some backpacking around South America and I spent time in Europe. So I did get to do all this traveling. But more importantly, I actually got some really important thinking time. So in South yeah. America, you travel on these buses, uh, you know, for 80, 20 hours at a time. And I had nothing to do. You know, there wasn't any Wi-Fi. The TV was in Spanish. And I was just journaling and writing and thinking, hold on, Sarah, what do you like to do? Not what you think you should like to do because other people think that you should like that stuff. But hold on, what are your passions, your interests, your hobbies? And for me, figuring this out, it took a lot of time. And it was, you know what, I love travel. I love adventure. I love challenge. But on the flip side, I also love motivating, inspiring women and girls. Working in banking, very, very male-dominated environment. And I was like one of the youngest female managers. I was always interacting with older, generally older white men in their 40s. And I was very confident in those situations uh, having discussions and debates and everything else. But I also worked with a lot of women who, who weren't as confident, who wouldn't put themselves forward, who wouldn't be their own advocate through no fault of their own. And I wanted to, to change that. I wanted to, to like, how can I make a big difference? And so even while I was doing my job, I was getting involved in organizations like Women for Women International. I was on their, um, uh, yeah, helped out with Women for Women International, uh, UN the UN London Committee, UN Women London Committee to get involved involved there. And so Tough Girl Challenges came about because I wanted to combine basically all my interests and passions and to show you know, young girls out there, look, I always got judged a lot on how I looked. And so I wanted to show girls, look, you can be tough and feminine. Because, you know, when people would look at me and I tell them some stuff they do, it was like, no, you couldn't have done that. You're not, you're not tough. You're not tough enough. You could never do that. And it's like, actually, you, you can still look a certain way. You can still like the color pink and like having your nails done and wear high heels mm-hmm. and still love going out and rolling in the mud and doing crazy adventures at the weekend. And, um, and I just wanted to prove that. And the, the other thing that I wanted to do as well was, was, like you said, to shine a spotlight on other women who are out there doing these adventures and challenges, which aren't getting covered in the mainstream media. And I wanted to show other women and girls that hold on, it's okay to like adventure, it's okay to like challenge, and you can get out there and, and do, these, do these big, amazing things. Other women are doing it. And if you can see it, then you can become it. So mm. that's how it sort of all came together. And the podcast was obviously a great platform for me to do that. Yeah, I love all of that. And there's so much there we could talk about. Um, and just to jump on a couple of your points, you know, what I love about the women's football team, apart from their success and their, um, you know, the, the increasing awareness and visibility of them, is that actually quite a lot of that team are, I hate the expression, but I'll use it so we, we don't chop around looking for other language, girly girls. You know, they are very feminine looking girls. Some of them are made up on pitch and some off pitch as well. They aren't all rough, tough, you know, <clears throat> adhering to any particular types of stereotypes. And I think that's very positive as well because it shows that all, no matter how you identify in terms of your, your visual image or anything else, you can still be into sport. Um, and, and it's one of the things I really love about that. Um, 
And uh, I wanted to come back though to, to, did you literally jump and then worry about whether you packed the parachute when you resigned, which was kind of my approach, or was it a little bit more structured? Because I know that's something that people are always want to know from me, and I'm, I'm sure they're going to want to know this from you on the show as well. You know, how much of a plan did you have, and how much did you leave to faith, and how much did you just think I just need to get out of here? I worry about what's what's down at the bottom when I've jumped. I didn't have much of a plan, to be honest. I just knew that I needed to get out. I needed to leave. I was just so done. But I'm in a very fortunate position. You know, I did have backstops. The fact that you know, my sister lived in London. She had a spare room. So I moved from cheaper rent to cheaper rent to cheaper rent to eventually moving in with her. Equally, my parents, who are amazing, I could, I knew that I would always, I always have a room at my parents' house. And I, that's where I ended up moving back to. So I knew I was never going to want for, for accommodation or for having to pay you know to live somewhere that would all be all be covered um I also knew that I had savings so I had I had enough money to last me for about 18 months traveling and that's if I was a bit you know frugal with it as well mm. but I ended up doing you know some quite big expensive challenges with that so that money bought me the Marathon de Saab's adventure which is you know around three and a half thousand I needed to buy myself a laptop to set me up and I paid for you know my flights to Australia and um flights to South America and stuff like that. So by the time I'd started Tough Girl Challenges in 2015, so about sort of 18 months later, I was, yeah, I spent, spent, all, <laughs> spent all my money. I was back living with my parents. Um, I had an idea and I had a laptop and I, I'd pay for my marathon to Saabs. And then that was basically my starting point. Mm-hmm. But I didn't, it, it, it's not as structured as, as I would have liked it to be. If I could go back, the one thing that I would change is I wish I'd started like my website and my blog while I was still working and built it up on the side before I left. Because if I would, if I was still sort of receiving a regular income, that would have made a profound difference to how quickly my business grew and how quickly I was able to get my brand out there. Yeah. Um, but you know, that obviously wasn't the case and I just did have to make the best of it. So definitely not as structured as I want to. And I think you know what, that's okay as well. Like it, it's okay sometimes just to see, let's just see where it takes us. And I think I've been in such a structured environment for so long, you know, every, everything was all org- organized and to the, to the ninth degree that it was actually quite good just to have this freedom. So when I went to South America, I just, you know, I bought a one-way ticket into Lima and a return ticket out of Rio. And then I had this four months in between just to see where the wind takes me, decided where I wanted to go. So that wasn't planned really at all. Um, so yeah. Hmm. And in terms of the, you just described it as, well, in terms of your business, was that, is that a very purpose led business or is it, it's, obviously you've also monetized it. This is how you, how you make it. How would you describe the business or the venture that you've created? Um, the, when I first started it, I, my basic, my dream, I've actually got a blog post written on this. My dream was obviously, you know, to motivate, inspire women and girls. And I put numbers on it, you know, I wanted to get like about 10,000 followers on each platform. I wanted to reach out to 1 million women around the world. But the other uh, key thing for me is well, I also wanted to create a living, breathing entity such as the website, which I could run from anywhere in the world. I wanted to be able to be nomadic. I wanted to be able to take my laptop with me. And, you know, if I wanted to visit family in Australia, but I could still be able to run my business from there I didn't want to be tied down so that was incredibly purposeful the thing that I didn't know and that I struggled with very much in the beginning was how to actually monetize it so podcasting is relatively new and um I I looked at, you know, trying to build it through the blog. I I wrote eBooks. I did motivational speaking. So I had lots of sort of other income streams coming in, but I was actually going into debt, I'd say for about two and a half years while I was building up the, the, the building up the podcast. You know, so when I started with the podcast in 2015, I started with four episodes and it got me, you know, maybe like 30 downloads in the first week. And it took me, um, it took me six months to get 25,000 downloads. It took me a year to reach a hundred thousand downloads and now I'm getting between 25 26 thousand downloads per month which is absolutely you know I, mm. I couldn't believe that going you know since it took me six months to get 25 thousand initially yeah. so um I I didn't know how I was going to be able to monetize um monetize the podcast I, I you know I had lots of ideas I had a ridiculous you know this is the planner in me I had a 200 page business plan which was probably more like you know procrastination instead of trying to get on with stuff but mm-hmm. I wrote about all of my marketing I wrote all of the my, my ideas for blog posts and merchandise and the different 
you know, whether I could do like festivals or events and all the different ways that I could make money. And there's hundreds of ideas in there. But sometimes it comes down to the fact, look, I'm a, I'm a one woman show. I've got limited time so everything that I do is an opportunity cost and so for me it just it just has to come back what are my interests what are my passions what is my mission and it it all becomes very clear when you know what your purpose is and my purpose is to increase the amount of female role models in the media and when I know what, what that is everything comes back to that and I mean, I've almost flipped. So I was very, very financially driven, you know, working in wealth management and financial services. Money was a big thing. And I'm not going to lie. You know, mm-hmm. But then I almost, I took that too far. And then on the flip side, when I started uh, working on Tough Girl Challenges, I remember I did this speaking gig for, for a charity and I did it for free for them. And they, afterwards they said, oh, Sarah, that was absolutely fantastic. Wow. Um, we, we've never had such an, you know, such an amazing reaction from our students. We'd, we'd love to get you, we'd love to get you back. And obviously we'd pay for, we'd pay for you to come back. And my response, and don't do this by the way, was like, oh no, I, you know, I couldn't possibly be paid for doing what I love to do. <laughs> it felt, it felt so wrong to take money from a charity where even though I was making a big difference. And I think that's been a quite, a hard learning curve in terms of valuing myself and valuing the content that I put out and and realizing that actually, you know, the stuff that you do is important and you do do deserve to get paid for the hard work that you put in, put into it. But the the game changer for me was actually Patreon. Um, I don't know if you've you've heard of it as a platform, Mm, but I I now, yeah. So I now have over 236 patrons who donate between or support me between $2 and $25 a month. And that all changed because I wrote a blog post basically saying, how I afford to blog and podcast. And it was basically, guys, I'm 35 years old. I live at home with my parents. I don't contribute towards the rent or the food or anything. Um, I sold everything I own pretty much on eBay. I work two part-time jobs. And, you know, although you may see me at the gym all the time or going out on these challenges, it's because I've because of everything else I'm doing behind the scenes and I think that was a key moment for a lot of my followers and also for me to be actually I need to be more transparent here because I never want to put the illusion out that oh I just quit my job in banking and now I'm an adventurer and I it's super easy to start a podcast and build this massive following and win awards and it's like no 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 (laughs) it's brutally hard work and it and it hasn't stopped for you know every single day I work incredibly hard in my business and on my business. So, um, yeah, but it's, but it's, but it's not stressful though, because I, I love what I do and I'm so privileged to be able to be doing this, um, that I couldn't be happier. Yeah. Are there any challenges? I mean, does it ever get lonely? You say you're a one woman band. Yeah, that is, that's the, that's the big thing. I would say that's been one of the biggest challenges. Well, the, the two big challenges is one, it's been loneliness and two, it has been the money side of things because, you know getting invited to go out with for your friend you know why don't you come to cinema come let's go for dinner let's go meet for afternoon tea or why don't we go and enter that race or you know come to this hen do come to this wedding and I'm like I can't do any of that because I I can't afford to and but you know what? that's a sacrifice and that's also a personal choice that I that I've made equally the loneliness and people not understanding what you do um so that can be really challenging because I think people think oh well, when you post on social media you take these beautiful shots and it's like it's not that easy to actually share your life on social media and you know I I live and work in my bedroom and don't get me my bedroom is beautiful I'm in it right now but I work from my bed because that's where I'm most comfortable I pull my laptop up when I wake up in the morning I will start editing podcasts start doing social media and sometimes I the only people I will speak to are my mum and my dad I'll go to the gym, say, you know, have a few chats with people at the gym, do my workout, come home and carry on working. And definitely for me last year, that was incredibly, because it really struck home for me last year. Like I I was okay for like the first couple of years because I was so focused. I, you know, everything was invested in Tough Girl. And then once I started, you know, started to earn some money and started to have some more free time, I was suddenly like, hold, hold on. I don't have any friends and I don't have a social life and i I don't talk to people unless I'm having these deeper, meaningful conversations recording, you know, recording for the podcast. And, um, that's something that I noticed. And so I actually ended up getting like this little job at a cafe, partly because I was losing the ability to talk, which you're probably thinking that cannot be possible, (laughs) but, uh, (laughs) but more like, like the daily interactions, like forgetting how to have conversations. And that was a, a really, uh, a difficult thing to realize, but I did realize it and started making changes. Mm. 
Yeah. Um, and talking of changes, did, you know, obviously you came from a wealth management background, you had money, you could have a very, uh, if you chose to, an extravagant lifestyle. How much of your values changed? I mean, they must have done because you're obviously running, operating on a much smaller budget now. But is your, have your values towards wealth and material things and possessions and everything else, I'm guessing it has, but to what degree has that changed? A huge percent. I, I look back now and I, you know, I'm mortified at how, how I spent my money. Like, but it was normal then. You go out to cocktails and you'd spend, like, it's £15 yeah. pound on a cocktail is normal. Yeah. Like, that's, that's an average price. And, and, it's, and I look back now and I'm just embarrassed. Like, I'm just like, God, if I'd only just been more sensible or had more awareness. So, yeah, 100% of my values have definitely changed. You know, I was, I was driven by money, materialism and status. You know, I, I like the fact when I told people where I worked and people were like, oh, you were, oh, wow. Um, you know, there was a big status thing in that. I like mm-hmm. the fact that when we were, you know, go to nice restaurants, I didn't need to look at the bill and I could get rounds in for all my friends. You know, that wasn't a problem. I, I liked having my Mulberry handbag, which I still actually have. But, you know, I liked having Chrissy on the beat on shoes. It was like, I, I liked it. I loved it. But then it's, as I sort of left and almost had my eyes opened, it was something like, actually... You know what I like more is being outside, is traveling, having mm-hmm. doing challenges and adventures. And what I sort of learned is I had all this stuff and I just I just sort of downsized and I, you know, I definitely became more of a minimalist. I don't sh- I mean I don't even like shopping. Like I just I don't shop, I don't buy stuff. Um like I it, it just doesn't bother me anymore. So I'm very much a minimalist. My my definitions of success now are am I happy? What is my physical and mental health like? Do I love what I am doing? Like, and freedom. And that's the freedom of choice over how yeah. I spend my day. Yeah. So, you know, some days I wake up, I'm like, do you know what? I want to go hit the gym. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. Other days I wake up and I'm like, do you know what? It's like the other day I did go hit the gym, but I came back and I had a really nice Epsom salt bath. I put a face mask on, I fake tanned, I moisturized, I did, you know, I was proper girly and I loved it. And, you know, then I had a nice lunch with mum and dad and then I thought, you know, what? I'm going to watch an afternoon movie and I'm going to have a little power nap. And that was my day. <laughs> and I was like, but you know what? That's okay. Um, because it was my choice. And then I have other days where I get up and I actually just edit back to back or I just do five or six interviews in, in a row. So, um, but in terms of success, when I look at my life, I could not in my definitions of success I could not be more successful and I could not be yeah. more happy <laughs> yeah well I'm pleased to hear it and I, I completely agree I, 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 that echoes my own feelings really about the definition of success and what what's really important uh, I think we've lost track of a lot of that stuff and I think it's it's driving a lot of the mental health issues that we're seeing in the world now we've got so disconnected from the, the stuff that's really important uh, nature the connections we have with each other, connections with ourselves, really understanding and knowing ourselves and doing things that make us happy. Um, we've got caught up instead in the material world where everything tells us we need a product to be happy or an app to be happy or not to be in the app to be happy. Um, that we've lost track of, I think, what's what's really what really makes us happy as human beings. And I just finished a really good book. I've mentioned it on a previous show, but Lost Connections by Johan Hari. I'm not sure if you've read that. but I've I haven't, but I'm going to be writing it down and put it on my list. It's very good. So he, he basically says that the, some of the reason why we become stressed, anxious, depressed is genetic, but not a huge component. Um, more, it's more environmental. It's more the, the, psycho, the biopsychosocial uh, reasons. So our environment, our disconnection from meaningful work, disconnection from values, disconnection from purpose, from nature. It's really worth a read for, for you and for anyone listening as well. Um, and it echoes some of what we, you've been talking about there in terms of you know, being very unhappy in this very material, uh, money-driven world. So talk to us then in, in the last, and this, the time has gone incredibly quickly, about what's coming up for you in terms of challenges. What are you gunning towards or training for now? Do you know, I'm so excited. So, well, earlier this year, so I did the big cycle ride. So I cycled last last September. I cycled from Vancouver in Canada all the way down to Cabo San Lucas in Mexico. I then flew across to see my brother who lives in Melbourne. He's just had um, a new baby boy, so a new nephew called Charlie. So I went to spend January and February with uh, with their family over there. I then went back to England via India to become a qualified yoga instructor, so 200-hour yoga teacher training. Back to the UK, did my personal training qualification 
Association. And now I am basically, I'm getting myself geared up to go and hike the Camino de Portuguese. So I'm going to be flying into Lisbon in September and Mm -hmm. hiking about 612 kilometers up to Santiago. So that's going to be the next challenge, which I'm, I'm really, really excited about. I'm going to be, I'm going to be vlogging the journey and sharing it on YouTube. And uh, yeah, it should be super fun. Like I, I wasn't, after doing Appalachian Trail, I wasn't that excited about hiking anymore. Mm. And, but now I feel back in that space where I'm like, yeah, this is going to be, this is going to be awesome. Like I still, my knee isn't the best at the moment. So I've been doing lots of rehab and lots of physio, but it's going to be like a different type of challenge. So I'm not trying to like gun it in, you know, like 15 days or something. I'm just out there to have the experience and, you know, to walk like 10 or 12 miles a day and just take it easy and to take in the beautiful sights and just go on this glorious walk. So Mm. that's going to be my plan for, for, September um, until sort of middle of October and then and then who knows like I'm normally much more I normally have much more plans uh, scheduled but this sort of the over the next couple of months I really don't I'm just trying to be very open and it's going to sound wishy-washy but open to the universe and open to what to what comes up to what comes available and just see what happens and where it takes me but yeah Portugal Brilliant. in September nice big nice hike are you fundraising for that or is it purely for, for kicks as it were just for, uh, uh, this is going to sound awful but I don't do fundraising I just I did I'd done it previously like running the London Marathon five times so for five years I was raising you know money for charity and because this is this is my business like I will be I'll be vlogging it and you know sharing it on YouTube and doing podcast episodes about it and I, I just get such a sense of enjoyment so it's just very much a personal personal thing yeah no, fair enough. So when you're hiking then on that sort of distance, what, what, go, what goes through your mind? Do you find you're again, torturing yourself with thoughts? I always get a, a nursery rhyme that, that just slots in with the rhythm of my cadence of da 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 tortures <laughs> me like an earworm. But I don't know. What, what's your experience when you're in the, I presume you're doing this alone. Well, I'm, I am doing it alone, but there are randomly, there's going to be a couple of people, there's going to be two guys who I met on the Pacific Coast Highway who are also going to be out there. So I probably will meet up with them at some point, um, which will be really nice. And then a few other people have messaged me through social media saying, oh, they'd love to come and join me for a couple of days here and there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, I, but I do actually find with, when you do these challenges, there's, there's always people that you're meeting, so you're never actually alone. But I will be starting it, will be starting it alone and see how it goes. But what do I, 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 to be honest, when I'm walking, I try a couple of things. So in the morning, I basically try not to use electronics until after 12 o'clock or one o'clock. So the morning is all about reflections and thoughts and, and also just trying to be present. So to be in that moment, where am I walking? What am I walking through? What am I seeing? What are the sights? What are the sounds? What would make good video clips? And, and also, you know, how am I, how am I feeling? Sometimes I ask myself questions. So like one of my favorite ones is, you know, what would you do if you won like 5 million pounds on the lottery? And then, then sometimes I take that really extreme, like, okay, you just been given a billion dollars like how do you spend it what do you do um I quite enjoy those things I always like I'm going to be interviewed on like the Ellen DeGeneres show what questions would she ask me (laughs) um so the morning is very much about me and sometimes I also think about the business different challenges I want to to focus on I, I may do some reflection time think back over my life in certain situations but to be honest I've done a lot of that thinking already while I was out on the Appalachian Trail so I've almost sort of like put my past demons to bed if that makes sense I've already done a lot of thinking about you know who I am and so I feel as though I know myself very very well um, and then in the afternoon what I end up doing is like listening to podcasts I love listening to podcasts and um, I all uh, either the interview episodes or I'm definitely a massive fan of like hardcore history which mm-hmm. is like Dan Carlton's like like six or hour six or eight hour epics and then the evenings are just uh, well that's catching up with friends you know having having a nice meal and um, with other people that you've met on the trail um but yeah like it's just wherever wherever my mind takes me but it's not uh i don't it's this challenge isn't going to be torturous as such it's not going to there should there should not be suffering on this challenge or i hope there's not going to be suffering Mm. okay last question then is there something out there a challenge that's been um you've thought about or it's been suggested to you that is too scary right now for you to do uh no uh good answer no uh, I, i'm just like it's not that for me it's not it's not about it being scary so there's challenges it's it's more about the logistics of it as in like how i can get it done there's also challenges which financially are just out of my reach and just not not possible for me to do so mm-hmm. for example you know right rowing across the Atlantic Ocean, i'd love to do it 
but I am in no way going to try and raise a hundred thousand pounds to do it. I'm just mm. like, no, I just, that for me, that's not fun. I have no enjoyment. If somebody Sweet. says to me, Sarah, come and row an ocean, we'll put you in a boat. I'm done, but I'm not spending my time trying to raise yeah. that some, those sums of money. You probably know N- Natalia Cohen. Who did yes, I do. I love Atlantic. her. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had her on the show? I think you have. Yes, I have. She's yeah. a really good friend. Yeah. Oh, right. I met, okay. her with her. I met her with her in Australia. We had, well, if you watched our Instagram stories, you will have seen how much fun we had. <laughs> right. I'm not on Insta. I came off it because the dog had more followers than me and it's just too much hard work. But, and it doesn't really meet my personal values. It's all picture based. <laughs> and I came off it anyway. But, um, so I've not seen that. But I met her when we delivered our TED Talks in November 2016. She was on just before me or just after me, one of the two. So we met there. Anyway, she obviously rode across now. And I thought, what an amazing challenge. I'd love to do something like that. And then in the course of our conversation, she said, um, everyone always says you must be so fit and strong when you, when you got off the boat. And she said, no, your legs are just wasted. Because of course, you, you don't, you probably doing about 10 steps a day. Yeah. Um, and that's what really puts me off something like that. Um, I had no idea it cost that much money, but just the fact that you never move off the boat which is such an obvious thing when you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, but your legs, she says your legs are just wasted. You know, your upper body's pretty thin and emaciated, but strong. Um, anyway, you were saying, so that it's financially out of reach. Or, or logistically. So I've also yeah. been thinking about the Pacific Crest Trail. So mm-hmm. walking from, you know, from Mexico to Canada, like 2,600 miles. And a lot of people want me to do that, to do that trail and to, to vlog about it and share about it. And the biggest challenge for me logistically is, a, how because I preload, I would preload content before I go. So I would not stop the podcast. I, I want the podcast to keep coming out every single week. So mm. it's, and I mean, if I put my mind to it, I could preload six months worth of content. It would possibly, uh, it, I mean, it would probably destroy me before I did it just to do that huge amount of work. But you know, if I put my mind to it, I could probably get it done. But the biggest challenge is how to vlog and how to to edit and produce like daily, not. Like whether a daily episode or three episodes a week just getting the footage out and edited and that's even if I had like a video editor like how to mm. do it so like those are the logistical challenges that I uh that I am trying to like figure out so it's not that anything scary um mm. no I, I literally I can't think of anything that it would be no Good. It's don't don't it's rack your brains. I like the Yeah, answer. sorry, I can't think of anything. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, we've got to wrap up, unfortunately. But um, your Instagram handle is at Tough Girl Challenges. Sarah Williams on YouTube. Uh, Twitter is at underscore tough underscore girl. Sarah Williams on Facebook. Uh, and the website is toughgirlchallenges.com. Um, is there any thought you want to leave people with before we sign off? Just, I just want to say, well, first of all, a massive thank you for having me on. It's been super fun oh, to chat to pleasure. you. And I would just say, if you've never listened to a, well, oh my God, I was going to say, if you've never listened to a podcast, we're obviously listening to this on a podcast. <laughs> um, but like, please do take a listen to some of the podcast episodes and co- a couple of the key messages w- which come out. It's about, um, it's about taking that first step. It's about starting. And I know it can be scary um, to, to do that, to do something new, to do something different, to do something outside of your comfort zone. But once you start, you will build, you will build momentum and that's how you get going and that's how you go out and achieve things. So make, just mm. do something something that challenges you that excites you but it's, it's personal to you and yeah and also just just go for it and have fun and just enjoy your life and live your best life possible mm. yeah that's true to your real values completely agree sarah thanks so much oh it's been so much fun thank you